my brother had gotten a car accident and broke his neck and back, and he got prescribed Oxycontin. And I had never even done um, like biking in or coding or anything like that. And they gave that to me, and that was the end of that. <laughs> I was doing pills all the time, going to work, doing it at work for, I think the pills were like at least six years. And then uh, my brother's doctor went to prison and we didn't get pills anymore. So we ended up starting to do uh, heroin. And at first I think we smoked it. And then I started shooting it up. I did that for like two or three years. And then I got just sick and tired of always having to well, I was sick and tired the whole time, but I could never get off of it. <laughs> but I finally went and I got on methadone. That was, that wasn't great either. But, uh, I hated that. I was always tired, falling asleep. Uh, I did that for, I think, three years. And I was actually, my dose was up quite a bit, but I don't know, one day, well, I think I was at Champions when I decided to, but one day I just decided to stop and I started tapering down. And the way they wanted me to do it at the place, it would have taken me two years. And I wasn't gonna do that, so I went two to three times as fast as they wanted me to. And I got off in a year. And I think it's been about a year now since I did that. That was just horrible. You know, doing things that I would never do normally or lying to people, cheating, stealing. I'd never do another opiate again, ever. Nobody could pay me enough to do it. <laughs> I, uh, I picked up the guitar when I got off of it and I never looked back. First six months I sat in my garage for eight to 10 hours a day and I didn't miss one day. And it was just the first thing that's ever been able to make me smile and laugh whenever I do it. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I love it. And I learned really fast too because everybody says I like play like I've been playing like five years and I've only been playing a year. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthew Dillon. Um, I've been sober for a year now and I'm born and raised in, here in Han or Armona. I started doing drugs when I was uh, 15. I was in high school. It stemmed from um, low self-esteem. Grew up in a home where the culture was different. My mom was Filipino, she was from the Philippines. It was more along the lines of you had to look, act, and carry yourself in a certain manner. So growing up, it was, you know, it, she was always on me about my weight, things like that, where it got to a point where she would, you know, tell me like, you know, nobody's gonna love you because you're overweight but yet she would still feed me like seconds and thirds. And so my self-esteem growing up was really low. When I got into high school, um, I was sophomore, I was 15 and um, I, was, I went to the restroom and there was a girl in there and I could hear a lighter flicker. And I was like, well, I don't smell cigarette smoke and I don't smell marijuana. And I was like, what are you doing over there, you know? And she was like, I'm smoking, I'm, I'm doing crank. And I was like, what's that do, you know? And she was like, it helps me lose weight. And so that's when the light bulb went off. I was like, really? And so that day I went home and um, I called some people that I knew that played around with that and um, asked them if they could introduce it to me. And, and that's where my addiction started. First year of my addiction, I uh, started losing a lot of weight. So I went from a size 18, 19 to a size 10 in the first year. And so with that, I was sold. And then it became more of a habit. I didn't realize that being so young that the addiction, what addiction was or how it was gonna affect my, my, uh, my life later on in the long run, or even, you know, my body or my self-esteem or anything. All I knew was that I was, I lost the weight. I had this confidence that I had never had before. And I thought I loved myself. As the years progressed, I, I became an adult, still in my active addiction, in and out of jail from the age of um, 18 to 29. Through the 15 years that I was in my addiction, I experienced uh, a lot of hurt and pain. I became very broken. I, um, I didn't love myself. The drugs were um, a form of um, self-medication to make me feel better about myself, to forget that, you know, I, I had the low self-esteem and I didn't. While I was, um, when I was in my early 20s, I moved away. 
I moved to Tennessee to, to try to do get a new start. I lived there for about three years, but I ended up uh, getting in more trouble over there. So in and out of the system, um, again, trying to figure out who I was. I was so young, um, things that I liked. Uh, I just self-medicated, you know, to find that love. I didn't love myself. I didn't know how to love myself. I wasn't taught to learn how to love myself because I was so criticized um, for the way that I was or the way that I looked for so long. I, I moved back to California and my, uh, my addiction got the best of me. You know, I thought I could do it on my own and I couldn't. So the last 10 years, I started using the needle to administer my drugs. Um, I was a, a closet needle user. With the, with the needle using, it, it came to a point where it was, if I didn't have it, I would be sick. And so I would constantly, you know, I'm always, I, I did things, you know, that I wasn't proud of to, to get my drug. I hung out with people that are very dangerous. In my addiction, I've been raped. I've been kidnapped. I've been held hostage at gunpoint. I've been um, beaten up pretty bad. All of those things were because of the, the lifestyle that I was living. And I thought I could handle myself and things like that, but there's just some things that, you know, women put themselves in situations and they, it's because of the people that they're hanging around with. It came to a point, um, I had got pregnant. I didn't know I was pregnant. I had a miscarriage. And so at that point in time, I, I stopped doing the drugs, but there was still that chance of me miscarrying. So they, the doctor told me, you know, yeah, well, we have good news and we have bad news. And so the good news is, is you're pregnant. I was like, what? And so there's that high, right, of excitement. And then, but the bad news is, is there's a good possibility you're miscarried. Eventually they did tell me that I was, um, that I had miscarried the child. The doctor told me it wasn't my fault, but in my mind, I, I, I put it that it was because of my drug use and how unhealthy and um, the lifestyle and everything that I was living that had caused me to um, miscarry this child. After the miscarriage, I went back out into my active addiction full force for about two months. And by the grace of God, I um, was arrested. And like I said, from age 18, I was in and out of jail. So jail and the idea of prison was nothing to me. Like, oh, I could do time on my head, you know? But they gave me a really short term for my charges. And um, I took that as a blessing. And I knew that at some point, at this point, that there, there has to be something different in my life. I had tr tried to go to a program a live-in program here in Hanford. They accepted me into this program, and and even though I don't have children, which that's one of the requirements, I took it as a blessing because they they said go ahead and and bring her. And so at that point, I knew that this is this is going to be my my new beginning. So with with working my 12 steps, I've learned to be more spiritual in in my walk and in, and in, in, in my recovery. When I went into the program, I didn't have any spiritual principles. I didn't believe in a higher power or anything like that. I didn't believe in prayer or, or anything that could help me that was uh, more powerful than myself. My, um, I have a great relationship with my higher power, which I call God. I attend church regularly, like I said, the meetings. I'm truly blessed today. The great support system that I have, building that foundation in my community with um, people that support me and have loved me until I learned to love myself. And just carrying that message of hope to, to those addicts that, um, that need to hear it, you know. If I, can, if I can overcome rape, drug abuse, being beat up, kidnapped, and all those traumatic things, then, then I believe that anybody can overcome those those uh, traumatic experiences that I once um, had to experience. My name is April Lancaster, and I was born and raised in Lemoore, California, and I've been clean three years.